Our speaker today, Ross Douthit, is a breath, a breath of fresh air in the usually predictable world of op-ed. Representing a new generation of conservative, commenta conservative commentator, Ross enlivens the editorial pages of the New York Times with his vigorous and penetrating analysis of domestic and international politics and government. He's the author of Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics, where he brilliantly charts institutional Christianity's decline. Ross is also the author of Privilege, a, bris a blistering critique of the university and co-author of the widely praised book, Grand New Party. Formerly a senior editor and blogger at The Atlantic, Ross has written on topics ranging from higher education to national politics to celebrities, religious, com celebrities, religious conversations. Please help me give a round warm welcome to Ross Dapit. Thank you for that very kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here tonight. It's lovely to be here um, at Exeter to talk about um, American conservatism in the midst of a very interesting election year um, for Republicans and now for everybody else. Um, and if you're not a Republican and you're anxiously watching the polls and wondering if it could be possible, could it be possible that Donald Trump could win the election, know that you're going through exactly the same things that Republicans and conservatives went through six months ago, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so I'm gonna talk, the title of my talk tonight is, um, I believe, Why America Still Needs Conservatism. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about conservatism as an idea, as a worldview in American politics, and how that worldview got connected to a political party, a political movement, how it rose to power, and then how it ended up being essentially um, hostily taken over by Donald Trump. Um, so a good place to start is with the idea of what, what is conservatism, right? And conservatives, when they're in a sort of somewhat boastful mood, will tell you that conservatism is not an ideology. Conservatism is the antithesis of all ideologies, because ideologies build structures of thought and try and fit the world into them, and conservatism is just rooted in the you know, home truths of human existence, the deep truths that endure no matter what civilization or society we're living in. That's a little bit self-serving, um, but there's, I, there's a truth there that I think that even liberals can agree with, which is that conservatism is a little more varied than other ideologies, because it varies with the culture and the situation that it is trying to conserve. So there tends to be more variation between um, sort of what a conservative is in Germany or the United Kingdom or France or Mexico or Canada versus what a conservative is in the United States. Because in each case, conservatism, less so I think than forms of liberalism and socialism, is fitted to the distinctive political culture, the distinctive society that is trying to essentially make sure stays roughly the same. Um, and so one good way to understand American conservatism is to think of it as an attempted defense of American exceptionalism. And by American exceptionalism, I don't mean the sort of chest thumping, we're the greatest country in the world, we're so awesome, um, sort of debasement of that idea, but the more sort of sociologically compelling view that America is exceptional among rich, developed nations across a number of features, and that this has been true for generations going back to the 19th century um, and was quite apparent in the middle of the 20th century when what we think of as the conservative movement first arose. And those distinctives, obviously you could list them at great length, but one good way to think about them is that America is a commercial republic, a more entrepreneurial and sort of self-consciously capitalist society than many European nations. It's a constitutional republic with a greater devotion to its constitution than many other developed nations, since we, after all, have only had one constitution, whereas, say, the French have had, you know, 176 on, that's a rough estimate, um, over, over the last couple hundred years. So we're a constitutional republic um, connected to our sort of commercial pro-capitalist vision is a suspicion of government power, a libertarianism rooted in everything from the frontier spirit to you know the, the sort of industrial industrial economy of the late 19th century down to the debates of the present day, and then we are, or at least have been, a more religious society 
than many other rich developed nations. And this, again, was sort of thrown into sharp relief as Europe became more secular in the late 20th century. But going all the way back to when Alexis de Tocqueville visited the US, he remarked on the sheer strength and diversity, and those two things were connected, of religious belief and practice in the US, and the distinctive way in which religious life and beyond that sort of communal life filled roles that in other societies were often just filled by public governmental state institutions. So the US has always had a stronger religious and communal life to go along with its suspicion of centralized government power. So that set of distinctives is the best way of understanding why different groups of conservatives ended up on the same team in certain ways. Because you know, if you just sort of isolated them from the American context, you might say that a Ayn Rand reading libertarian and a you know, Bible-waving fundamentalist Christian don't necessarily have that much in common philosophically. And in many ways, they don't. And there are cleavages there that have um, been difficult for conservative politicians and conservative intellectuals to finesse. But what's true is that the libertarian and the, and the religious conservative um, have in common a connection to American distinctives, basically, that, put, that, that puts them in certain ways on the same, not, not, not always on the same team, you might say, but on the same side, broadly speaking, in debates about how much America should change, how much America should imitate European institutions in particular, European secularism, European welfare state institutions, and so on. Um, so that, I think, is sort of a big part of where what we think of as a sort of cobbled together conservative intellectual coalition of social conservatives, economic conservatives, libertarians, and also foreign policy conservatives um, ultimately came together. Um, and, but when they came together in the sort of birth of the modern conservative movement in the 1950s, they were defending American exceptionalism in a country that wasn't as worried about the decline of American exceptionalism as they were. So if you go back to the beginnings of the conservative movement, to William F. Buckley Jr. and then later Barry Goldwater and so on, many conservatives at that point looked at Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal and said, this is a betrayal of American exceptionalism. This is a betrayal of basic American values. We're you know, becoming more Germanic or Teutonic. We're imitating, we're imitating um, Marxists and socialists and so on. And the American public, in their great wisdom, tended to disagree and tended to think that, well, you know, maybe some elements of American liberty and American exceptionalism have been lost in the 1930s and 1940s, but the trade-off was well worth it. Um, and Social Security and the GI Bill and all these features of sort of mid-century American liberalism were worth embracing, um, even at the cost of a certain older readings of the Constitution, for instance. So this is why American conservatism began as a kind of intellectual movement crying in the wilderness and urging Americans to sort of repent their flirtations with statism and socialism, and why in the beginning most Americans didn't listen, and why when Barry Goldwater became the first actual ideological conservative nominated by the Republican Party, he lost the race for the presidency in a landslide. So conservatism only went from being this sort of intellectual minority to being something approaching a political majority when it linked itself to voters and constituencies that didn't share its precise vision and had, like most normal human beings, a more transactional view of politics. A view of politics basically as, you know, the way that you keep public order, maintain economic growth, and um, run public programs effectively. And that is, so what happened in the 1960s and 1970s, what happened as America went from Barry Goldwater to Ronald Reagan, is that the liberal governing class, the New Deal Great Society liberals, were perceived as, as failing at those tasks. They were perceived as failing to keep public order as a huge crime wave surged over American cities from the 1960s onward. They were seen as failing to protect and, and promote the national defense in their, in, and it's, it's strange in the aftermath of Iraq to think of an era when liberals were associated with failed foreign wars, but uh, in, in the, the, the sort of disasters of Vietnam were associated more with liberalism in certain ways than with conservatism, and also divided liberalism 
internally in various ways that conservative politicians were able to exploit. So you have crime, you have foreign policy, and you have a sense in general that the Great Society programs weren't working that well, um, that welfare programs in particular were badly administered, were failing the people they were supposed to help, were creating an underclass that in turn fed into the crime wave and so on. And then you had a sense, um, finally, that an accurate sense that uh, liberal economic policy, the sort of basic post-war Keynesian model, didn't know how to handle the challenges of the 1970s, and that was how you ended up with stagflation um, and the various economic crises that helped Ronald Reagan get elected president of the United States in 1980. And then the story of the subsequent 20 years, in certain ways, the story of what we now think of in hindsight as the era of conservative dominance in American culture, is a story of conservatism gradually becoming a victim of its own success. So conservative politicians like Reagan had won a large number of especially white working class and white middle class voters who had previously been Democrats, who were voting for Republicans on the basis of crime and race, on the basis of foreign policy, on the basis of the fact that their, their tax brackets were creeping up and inflation was eating into their paychecks and so on. They weren't voting for an abstract vision of sort of a perfect libertarian government or anything like that. They were voting for um, particular policy goals. And in certain ways, American conservatism met those, sort of achieved those goals in large ways and small over the next generation. Um, and obviously liberals and conservatives can argue endlessly about who actually deserves the credit for these changes. But the reality is that under Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, the Cold War came to an end and America basically won. Um, the reality is that from the mid-1990s onward, um, crime rates fell dramatically, um, often in cities that had Republican mayors like Rudy Giuliani and that pursued crime-fighting policies that conservative intellectuals had championed. The reality is that in the mid-1990s, welfare was reformed by Bill Clinton but under a Republican Congress and that at least for the period immediately following that, the economy boomed. Um, more and more people found work and welfare reform seemed to be a great success. And then there was a sort of twofold economic boom, a Reagan boom and then a boom under Bill Clinton that followed from the shift in the late 70s and early 80s to a lower tax, lighter regulation model of political economy than had prevailed in the 50s and 60s. So you had economic growth, you had crime down, you had welfare reform, you had the Cold War over, and you even had some turnarounds of some of the trends that had made social conservatives very worried in the 1960s and 1970s, and that had encouraged for, you know, Catholics, for instance, who had been lifelong Democrats to shift to the Republican side. Beginning in the, beginning in the 1990s, the teen pregnancy and birth rate began to go down. The abortion rate began to go down. Um, the, the divorce rate began to go down. So there was a sense that some of the dislocations of the 1960s were at least partially resolving themselves. And what that meant, though, was that conservatism still had its broad vision. It still had its vision of American exceptionalism, its ideas about the importance of limited government and strong families and religious faith and constitutionalism and so on. But it no longer had a policy agenda pitched to not particularly ideological uh, middle and lower middle class voters. And some Republican politicians sort of started to realize this, and part of the basis, for instance, of George W. Bush's compassionate conservatism was the idea that conservatives had to shift a little bit and start talking about a new set of issues. Uh, for Bush, it was education in particular, but he also expanded Medicare, um, basically taking an issue from Democrats, um, and you know, sort of betraying certain conservative principles along the way, but for a little while at least nobody seemed to mind. So Bush, Bush had one model basically where you would sort of move to the center on a few economic issues and combine that after 9-11 with a, a hawkish foreign policy that treated the war on terror the way you would treat, the way Republicans had treated the Cold War and so on. Um, but all of that came to grief with the financial crisis and the disastrous outcome in Iraq, excuse me, and that meant that conservatism um, had seen its attempt to essentially reach out and reinvent itself end in disaster. So after Bush's defeat, there was this strong sense that, well, we need to get back to basics, right? This was the theory behind some of the Tea Party. We need to get back to limited government. 
Um, we need to get back to constitutionalism. And the fact that Barack Obama had been swept into power with an ambitious liberal agenda seemed to dovetail perfectly with that narrative. And conservatives told themselves, OK, this is going to be LBJ and Jimmy Carter again, all over again. And we're going to play Ronald Reagan and stand on principle and you know, stop the growth of the federal government and be rewarded by the voters and so on. And in 2010, in those midterm elections, that seemed to work. Um, it didn't work as well in 2012, but Republicans did it well again in 2014. And so there was a sense among a lot of Republican elites, I think, fairly recently, um, that they had sort of figured their situation out and that this was actually a political moment after six years of Barack Obama that was right for a kind of instantiation of these more abstract conservative principles about what America should be, what the Constitution should be, and so on. Um, but what they had missed was that actually many of the voters who voted Republican in the 2010 and 2014 midterms weren't really voting for you know, a sort of strict view of the, what powers the Tenth Amendment reserves to the states or anything remotely like that. They were voting against Obama in 2010 for economic reasons, because the economy was still bad, and because they were sort of lower, lower middle class people with, um, who already had health insurance but had trouble affording it and felt threatened by the nature of the Obamacare reforms. And then they were voting against Obama in 2014 for related reasons, but also for reasons of a sort of intertwined cultural and economic anxiety concerns about mass immigration, especially in this sort of bipartisan attempt to pass a very complicated and sweeping immigration overhaul um, that many middle and working class whites opposed for reasonable reasons and bigoted reasons both, I would say. Um, and so, and none of these voters were particularly interested in a lot of the sort of abstract platitudes about you know, limited government and true conservatism and so on that a lot of professional conservatives were invested in. Um, they were voters, or they, they were voters, or the children of voters who had become Republicans in the 70s and 80s because of a totally different set of issues, and who had become sort of tribally Republican, and not least because the Democratic Party had moved somewhat to the left since then, so they had less and less of a natural home there. Um, and, you know, they were sort of they, they were American exceptionalists in a certain sense, in the sense that they had sort of a, you know, ideas of God and country were very, were very important to a lot of these voters, even if they didn't go to church. Um, but they were not at all programmatic conservative <coughs> ideologues, not even remotely so. And they felt basically sort of let down and betrayed by the governance of both political parties. And then they met Donald Trump. And Trump, and, and this is, I think, the fascinating thing about Trump, and we don't know the answer to this and probably never will know because I don't think he's going to write a deeply introspective political memoir, but <laughs> I, I don't know to what extent, sorry, Trump sort of intuited this reality, um, this sort of political opportunity, to what extent he sort of saw it in advance as he came into the race, to what extent he sort of adapted himself to it. it. It seemed that he had sort of deliberately played to sort of racial dog whistles and so on, that he sort of understood that there was a piece of the Republican base that would really like a guy who sort of went all in for birther conspiracy theories and so on. That was sort of clearly a part of his plan for becoming a nominee, if he, to the extent that he had a plan. But once he sort of moved into the actual race and began sort of, you know, seizing on issues and so on, you know, he clearly had some understanding of the resonance of immigration in, to the Republican base, but he also sort of, you know, his own political background was independent, sometimes liberal Democrat, sort of sometimes opportunistic, and he had a sort of personal freedom that no Republican politician has ever felt to sort of mix and match policies, to pander in certain ways without fear of, um, you know, losing, losing the ideological enforcers or the interest groups. Um, and so he ended up with a primary campaign perfectly pitched to the about 35 to 40 percent of the Republican electorate that he ultimately won. Um, not sort of 
desperately poor voters. This is sort of an argument that people in my profession have constantly. You know, who are Donald Trump's voters? Are they the white poor? Are they hillbillies, to borrow the title of this book, Hillbilly Elegy, that's become very popular, and deservedly so, in the age of Trump? Or are they, you know, prosperous, um, prosperous white people who are just scared of brown people, right? Those are sort of the two poles of the debate, and I think the answer is in between. They are the white lower middle class. Again, they're people who are usually employed, um, who are usually reasonably stable sort of year to year in their salaries, but who live in regions and work in industries that have been hit hard by globalization and who sort of operate in a landscape of economic instability and with sort of the level of social breakdown and social fragmentation in working class white America, a large amount of social and cultural frag fragmentation all around them. So, you know, the, the um, sort of paradigmatic Trump voter isn't um, the jobless white guy in upstate New York shooting heroin. It's the jobless white guy in upstate New York's father who's, who's raising his son's seven-year-old kid because the father's such a mess and sort of sees this landscape, you know, is doing okay himself, but sees this landscape of social and economic breakdown around him and fears for the future. And again, it feels abandoned by both political parties. And Trump comes in and offers a politics in part of nostalgia for an industrial economy in which blue collar work, especially for men, was more remunerative. He also offers a sort of future oriented politics in a weird way. And this is something people, you know, people talk about how dark Trump is and how pessimistic, and he is in a sense. But remember, his slogan is make America great again. Right? And the image of Trump, Trump, you know, he, we're going to build building, you know, we're going we're gonna to sort of be rich again and so on, is in certain ways a callback to the optimism of 1960s America, in which many of the people voting for Trump came of age. So he's combining sort of, you know, basically it's sort of protectionism and immigration restriction as a means to recapture a future that we thought we were going to have and that is slipping away. Um, and the Republican Party, and especially the conservative movement, had no idea how to handle this. And conservative politicians who were sort of came up in this long period when the conservative movement and the Republican Party were pretty much the same thing, spent all this time in the debates. You saw this with Rubio and Cruz over and over again explaining, Donald Trump is not a conservative. Look how he deviates from conservatism on this issue and that issue and that issue and that issue. And you know, that probably would have been enough to stop Trump if Trump had needed 51% of the primary vote, but he didn't in a broken field. He needed at first 30%, then 35%, then 40%. And the reality was that a large chunk of regular and irregular Republican voters didn't care about the sort of set of movement conservative litmus tests that had developed over this long era. And what that meant was that in this remarkably short span of time, movement conservatism, which from Goldwater to Reagan had sort of taken over the Republican Party, just lost it. The Donald Trump campaign is not a movement conservative campaign, and movement conservatives have been totally divided over whether to support him, what to do, whether to oppose him, whether to run a third party candidate, and so on. Um, and that divide is going to persist until election day, and then it's going to persist beyond it as the Republican Party and conservatives try and reckon with what Trumpism means. Um, and I guess this brings me around to the actual title of my talk because, the, well, in, in one moment it does. First, everyone, everyone who's watched this strange thing unfold um, will have a different answer um, about what Trump means for American politics, what lessons should be learned, and so on. But there is a, you know, th there will be an important debate, and assuming that he loses, and I do still think he's likely to lose, notwithstanding the joke with which I opened these remarks, or the latest polls in Ohio. Um, I do still think that he will lose, but I thought that in the primary. Anyway, I do still think he will lose. And when he does, there will be a division, including among conservatives who, who agree in opposing him over to what extent the lesson of the Trump era will be that the party simply needs to repudiate Trumpism and all his works, or to what extent the party needs to learn from Trump's success 
and change itself in order to better serve many of his constituents. Um, and I fall into the second camp. I think that Trumpism, as we see it, is a tangle of you know white identity politics and bigotry and xenophobia and offensiveness and sort of you know I'm personally a religious conservative and Trump represents a post-religious conservatism in many ways, um, in spite of his appeal to the evangelicals, as he likes to call them. Um, so there are many things to dislike or be dismayed about in Trumpism, but the reality is that Trump understood the nature of politics better than most Republican politicians did. And the nature of politics is you have to wed your ideology, your intellectual view of the world, your you know, sort of view of what the ideal, the ideal politics is, the ideal policy agenda is, you have to wed it to the actual concerns and needs of actual voters. And there is a big part of Trump's message, um, and it includes not only, not only sort of economic policy, but also foreign policy, and his, frankly, you know, totally self-serving, but frankly justified critiques of how American foreign policy has been conducted for the last 10 years. There is, in those arguments, a response, a real response to the failures of both parties to address the needs of lower middle class Americans over the last 10 or 15 years, and especially the failure of the Republican Party that represents lower middle class white Americans um, in ever increasing numbers. And so that doesn't mean that Trump has the right answers. It doesn't mean that building a wall on the Mexican border and throwing up huge tariffs is the best solution to economic decline and social dislocation. But those are problems that need a solution, and they need more of a solution than Mitt Romney campaigned on in 2012 or than John McCain campaigned on in 2008. Um, I think basically the Republican Party needs to look they essentially course correct on the basis of things that Trump got right. Course correct somewhat on economic policy and focus a little bit more on economic solidarity and course correct to some extent on foreign policy and focus a little more on sort of defining what is the national interest um, in our current era and you know how do we choose our battles wisely instead of just assuming that you can be sort of a full spectrum foreign policy hawk and make everything work. So that's what I would that's what I would like to see happen. That's what I think conservatism needs to take from the success of Donald Trump. Um, but then part of why I think and want conservatism to take that from the success of Donald Trump is because that to me is the only way that American conservatism will actually remain politically viable by gaining a little harder and realism about American politics from watching what Trump has done and how thoroughly he's sort of carved up their party and using that wisdom to rebuild a political coalition that still has conservative values, basic conservative values at its heart. Um, because while I think that the American right can learn something from Trumpism, a Trumpism without sort of the values of American conservatism, without those ideas about American exceptionalism, will just be a very, very sort of purely dark force. If you, and you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of scholarly debate about why America never developed a real sort of Marxist or socialist political movement. Um, but it's equally interesting to think about why we never developed a massive fascist movement. You know, there were some flurries in the 1930s and so on, and obviously I had liberal friends who thought George W. Bush was a fascist, but Realistically speaking, America doesn't have a fascist political tradition in national politics. It never did, never developed one. And I think part of the reason it never did was precisely the link between American conservatives and those sort of American exceptionalist ideas about liberty, personal religiosity, a limited government, and so on, that are in many ways anathema to the sort of corporatist, religion of the state worldview that fascist parties tend to end up with. And one of the reasons that I thought Trump wouldn't win the Republican primary was precisely that I thought that those ideas were still powerful enough among enough Republican voters that they would, you know, that religious conservatives would reject Trump because he's, you know, a, a pagan, right? And that um, libertarian conservatives would reject Trump because um, he's the, the furthest thing from a libertarian. 
And in the end, it turned out there just weren't enough primary voters who had those kind of commitments to actually stop Trump. But those commitments are still hugely important in American political life. And they're even more important now because in many ways, various features of the American exceptionalism that American conservatism started out to defend are actually seem to be going away. You know, the United States is no longer as Tocquevillian as it once was in terms of church going, in terms of sort of community life and so on. We're a more atomized and fragmented society than we were even 10 or 15 years ago. We have, you know, we used to have a higher birth rate than Western Europe, now we have a lower birth rate than many Western European countries. Um, and, you know, the size and scope of government, excuse me, has also expanded at pace in ways that, again, make us sort of less exceptional and that are connected to the decline of American dynamism. The American economy has recovered only sluggishly from the Great Recession, and sort of entrepreneurial culture in the U.S. is weaker than it used to be. If you just look at charts of how many startup companies there are, and if you look at sort of the likely trajectory of economic growth, the sort of traditional vision of American growth as this steady upward upward ascent of sort of technological innovation, piling on technological innovation, it's at least open for debate whether we're still on that trajectory. And so America needs a politics that focuses on those problems. Doesn't mean that people who support those, pol those, those politics will always be right or correctly identify the best thing to do about those issues and problems, but they are real problems, real issues. You don't have to be a religious person to worry about what the collapse of religion means for working class life in white, black, and Hispanic communities. You don't have to be an economic conservative to worry about what the loss of dynamism and entrepreneurialism means for the future of American growth and American wealth. And if you are an American conservative, you should be focused on those problems and you should want a, a right of center politics that is focused on them as well. And if conservatives can't figure out a way to come to grips with the Trump phenomenon, it's possible that they'll successfully, you know, push Trump supporters out of the Republican Party and, you know, recreate a more ideologically pure Republican Party that will then win 37% of the vote in national elections. But that might happen. But the other possibility is that if conservatives can't figure out how to deal with Trumpism and adapt to it, that they'll be the ones sort of pushed to the margins of a Trump, of a totally Trumpist Republican Party in which those ideas about American exceptionalism, actual American exceptionalism, not just sort of make America great again exceptionalism, lose any purchase or any place and you'll be left with an American conservatism that looks like, you know, the National Front in France or other sort of nationalist parties in Western Europe and has less and less in common with the conservatism of Buckley and Goldwater and Reagan. And I think that would be a dark thing for America, not just for the American right, but for everyone involved in our politics. So ultimately, that's why I think America still needs conservatism, but because America still needs conservatism, conservatives have an awful lot of work to do to figure out what lessons to draw from the strange and fascinating rise of Donald Trump. So I'll leave things there. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. No, you. Oh, yeah. uh, so the other day I saw, I can't remember who it was, but I believe it was a conservative congressman on MSNBC, and he was talking about how the direction of the Republican Party would sort of still be in shambles if Donald Trump were to win the presidency. He talked about how essentially what you were discussing as well, if he were to lose, how essentially they sort of lost this identity that they had. I was wondering what your take would be on what would happen to the Republican Party were Trump to win the presidency. Good God, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, this this is it's just totally uncharted territory. Not, I mean, what would happen to the country, right? Um, I think you could make two different arguments. Um, the first argument is that Trump doesn't really want to be president, right? He wants to be king. 
he wants to be, a, a, but but not a busy king. Not I mean, this is this is this is the argument for not worrying that much about a Trump presidency, right? You would say, look, Trump likes to tweet. He likes to go speak to large rallies. He likes to be on TV. He just wants, you know, to sort of go around and be the celebrity in chief. And so the country will be end up run by, I would have said Mike Pence and Chris Christie, but I don't know how many of you saw the news today about, you know, more evidence of Christie's fairly obvious involvement in the whole Bridgegate thing. So maybe it'll just be Mike Pence and Rudy Giuliani. Um, and, the, you know, those are names that would strike fear into liberal hearts, but they would be normal within the spectrum of American politics, right? If Trump really didn't participate at all in the day-to-day -day running of his government, and if he just basically said, you know, well, Pence is my vice president, but he'll be like Dick Cheney only times a thousand, and he'll, you know, pick the foreign policy team and pick the domestic policy team and so on. Pence is a very conventional, sort of full spectrum, economic, social conservative, and he would probably be a deeply unimaginative chief executive and a fairly polarizing one because he's quite conservative, but the Republican sort of infrastructure would then just sort of slide into place in the same way it maybe would have in a, um, you know, in a Marco Rubio administration to some extent. And it would be weird because Trump would be out there being Trump, but the party would sort of, you know, Mike Pence and Paul Ryan would sit down and decide what legislation Congress was going to try and pass, and then Trump would come out and give some rambling speech endorsing it. And th this is sort of the dream of the Republican elites who support Trump, basically. That, that, that's what's, what will happen. And it, I mean, again, this is uncharted territory. It could, right? We could end up with a very conventional Republican administration wrapped in this weird, you know, sheet of wacky Donald Trump. At the same time, you know, the counter argument is that Trump has poisoned the well with a large percentage of sort of professionals, especially foreign policy professionals. Um, you could have mass civil service resignations if he's elected. Um, you would have possibly some military resignations. You would have trouble staffing important foreign policy offices. You'd have a lot of debate about, you know, among sort of Republican figures about whether they could or wanted to go to work for him. Um, and with all that going on, even then, even if Trump doesn't want to participate that much in the day-to-day, -day, you'd still end up with a situation where the people running his administration would be this weird court of, you know, sort of opportunists and, you know, the editor of Breitbart and, you know, sort of the last people you would have expected being empowered in administration. And presidential administrations are weird and complicated things to begin with. Um, and so that's sort of, that's, I think that's a little more likely. Um, I think there would be a lot of, maybe at some point Mike Pence would sort of succeed in restoring order, but there would be sort of crazy internal power struggles from day one. Um, there would be lots of weird people in offices, and you know, I'm a weird person, I don't want to be pejorative, but there would, there would be people who you would never imagine in offices who would end up in those offices. Um, and you'd have a, probably a series of strange crises and, you know, there, there would be some sort of weird economic reaction to Trump winning. There would be some weird foreign policy reactions to Trump winning. I don't know what Vladimir Putin would do if Trump was elected. But all of that would create this sort of weird cascade that would then shape American conservatism in ways I can't, I just can't predict. It's, it's completely unpredictable. I mean, my, my assumption is that a Trump administration would be a catastrophic failure and that this would probably, you know, sort of end up discrediting some of his ideas and many of his personnel and so on, but at the same time, he'd be president for four years, and that's a long time to put your stamp on a party. And during those four years, as we've seen just in the last six months, lots of sort of partisan Republicans would feel that they had to be on board with him even, you know, as the Russian nukes began to fall on Poland, right? They'd still be saying, you know, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I mean, it's a weird year. Um,
So right, so that's a very long-winded way of not answering the question, but saying that there's a less likely scenario where sort of political normalcy is restored sort of beneath Trump, and there's a more likely scenario of we've never seen anything like this before, and therefore we can't predict. Yes? So assuming Mr. Trump isn't elected, and you and others in the Republican Party, the Conservative Party, have an opportunity to rebuild something that you would consider to be a realistic conservative right of center party, uh, and this is probably a softball for your latest book, um, what would that conservatism look like? Would it be closer to a libertarian platform in terms of social policy, foreign policy, economic policy, or would it be closer to the Tea Party kind of platform that I think like Pence represents? Um, well, it would be, this, this was an argument that the book you referenced actually came out a long time ago. Um, so I've been making these arguments for, I guess, eight or nine, well, let's call it 10 years. Um, but no, I mean, ba basically, my vision would be um, a, to, to put it crudely, it would be a more economically moderate party. That would be sort of the core change. Um, that the party would be still very interested in sort of using the power of markets and, and so on to reform existing government programs, but it would also not be zealously focused on, you know, making sure that like the Paul Ryan budget, that we get government spending down to 16% of GDP by 2040 on some frankly imaginary timeline. Um, it would be a politics that focused more on family policy um, that, you know, took some ideas that Marco Rubio tried to run on um, about making tax policy more friendly to families with children, um, finding ways to subsidize low-wage work, um, increasing the earned income tax credit, creating new wage subsidies, and so on. Um, but that generally sort of tried to craft an agenda that sort of was directly focused on sort of the everyday economic costs of life for Americans making $42,000 a year, which right now, you know, the Republican Party doesn't have that kind of agenda. Um, its tax policies generally, you know, benefit, it's not just that they benefit the rich, it's that they've sort of lost any real sort of direct benefit to people in the lower middle class. Um, you would need a health care policy that accepted that some version of Obamacare was here to stay, and you couldn't just sort of take coverage away from people. You could reform and change the program, but you couldn't just abolish it and send the uninsured rate back up. Um, and I, you know, I could have sort of a laundry list of other small bore policy ideas, but that's that's the basic idea. That basically conservatives should be interested in reforming economic policy and welfare state policy in ways that support work and family in sort of stressed out lower middle class communities. Um, and that contrast with the Democrats by being focused on work and family and not being sort of just, well, we're gonna you know, expand welfare programs, period. We're gonna create new entitlements here. Um, but said, no, we're gonna, link, we're gonna link any new spending to work and child rearing um, because those are forces that are connected to you know, the sort of binding up of American communities that needs to happen if American exceptionalism is going to survive. So that's that's sort of my that's my pet view. That sort of the Tea Party went too far to the right on economic policy in certain ways and that while there are many libertarian ideas that I agree with, the libertarianism that should be pursued is the more populist variety that you should be focused on, you know, sort of crony capitalism more than you're focused on cutting food stamps and so on. Um, and then I also have other ideas, but that's that's sort of where that's the most specific response. And I and foreign policy. Well, foreign policy. This is where I, I say something. I don't have clearly. I have a clearly defined view of what's wrong with Republican foreign policy. I don't have a clearly defined view of what it should be. But basically, Republican foreign policy has ended up unable to sort of figure out how to rank threats in a hierarchy. So Russia is a threat. Um, ISIS and al-Qaeda are threats. Iran is a threat. China is a threat. And, and we're just, you know, we're just going to oppose them all, right? We're going to destroy ISIS and never cut any deals with Iran and stand up to Putin and stand up to China. 
and so on. Um, and, you know, even though Republicans now are opposed to the Libya intervention, lots of Republicans supported the Libya intervention, which I think has basically been a disaster. Um, lots of Republicans think Obama should have sent ground troops into Syria. So Republicans are just has, have a sort of full spectrum hawkishness that I don't think has a clear definition of the national interest and that wants to treat all of these threats as sort of the equivalent of the Soviet Union when really we need to figure out which one is a version of communist China that we can peel away Nixon style and worry about a little less. Now that's where I don't have a clear answer to that. I mean my impulse in years past has been to say Republicans need to be a little less hawkish around Russia and that we need to work more with Russia. Uh, and this of course is Donald Trump's perspective. Look at that. That's case, though, has been weakened by Putin's adventurism and his obvious desire to sort of, you know, opportunistically weaken NATO and the EU. Um, so it's a little harder for me to make that case than it was a few years ago. Uh, but that's, so again, I, I don't have a sort of Kissingerian grand strategy, but I think Republicans need, they need, a, they need a grand strategy. And they had briefly the war on terror as an organizing principle, and that's sort of fallen apart for bad reasons and good reasons. But and we're still fighting a war in Afghanistan. I mean, one of the things that being in D.C. during the Iraq War years, I, I was, you know, a young journalist who had lots of young friends who worked in the State Department and the Defense Department and so on. Do you realize just how hard it is for the government to see through any complicated project, but certainly a complicated foreign policy project to fruition, right? And um, you know, and you see this in, in the Obama era too, nothing on the scale of the Iraq war, but uh, you know, we went into Libya and then didn't want to deal with it, and we didn't deal with it, and you know, it ended up where it is, as a sort of a safe haven for terrorists and so on. Um, we wanted to pull out of Iraq, and we pulled out of Iraq, and then the State Department decided to focus intensely on the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, and while John Kerry was focusing on that, ISIS was taking over a third of Iraq before we had sort of even noticed it. And this isn't to sort of necessarily critique those policy choices, it's just to say it's really hard for the government to do five or six things well in foreign policy at once. And so you can't have a foreign policy vision that says, well, we should have toppled Gaddafi and sent ground troops into Libya, and we should have gone to war with Assad and with ISIS, and we should have, shouldn't de-escalate in Afghanistan, and we need to send more and more arms to Ukraine and be ready to fight them. Like, you have to choose and focus, and Republicans need a politics that chooses and focuses. And I think of the primary candidates, apart from Trump in his way, Cruz was actually, you know, he didn't have, a, he didn't any, have specifics any more than I did, but he tried to make some version of this argument against um, the sort of more idealistic Wilsonian vision of Rubio. So, you could say that I, I want a Republican Party that has a little more of Rubio's domestic policy ideas and a few more of Cruz's foreign policy ideas, but instead I've got Donald Trump. So. <laughs> yes? Um, so, what extent do you think uh, the rise of Trumpism will have on the libertarian sector of the Republican Party, and also to what extent do you think third parties will play in this election? Well, right now, so I'll take your second question first. Right now, the third party seems, the Libertarian Party seems, and varies from poll to poll, but seems to be helping Hillary more than Trump. Um, and certainly the presence of Jill Stein hurt, helps, uh, hurts, hurts Hillary and helps Trump. But there seems to be a group of voters who are, you know, probably more economically liberal than Gary Johnson, but who for whom his sort of lifestyle libertarianism is appealing, his, you know, sort of weird authenticity is appealing compared to Hillary. And so, you, you know, you have some sort of people who might have been Bernie Sanders voters who are currently backing Johnson. And when I try and imagine these strange scenarios in which Trump actually wins, um, something along those lines plays a role, some sort of unusually high third party vote of voters who wouldn't ever vote for Trump, but didn't want to vote for Hillary and found in Stein and Johnson sort of places to send their votes. So that's sort of the political question. On policy and the future of the party, I don't know. I mean, what's interesting is that Johnson, I think, sensing this opportunity, has run a campaign that's a little more of sort of a, uh, 
you know, sort of lifestyle focused um, libertarian campaign, a little less focused on economic issues and so on. So he hasn't he hasn't created. It's not like if Rand Paul were the libertarian nominee for president, then you would have a situation where sort of libertarianism as a sort of coherent ideology was a real, you know, a real player as a third party, and then it would be interesting to see what, um, how the Republican Party responded to that. I think the way Johnson has run his campaign, that's, there's less likely, it's less likely that people will look at that and say, well, this shows what libertarianism as an ideology could be or mean. Um, and then, you know, I mean, but then going forward, I mean, certain libertarian ideas on economic policy and immigration to some extent have incredibly strong appeal among Republican elites. And so in the, the, some of those ideas will retain their currency in the party after Trump loses no matter what. Um, and there will be, you know, I mean, Trump has been bad for libertarianism in a sort of a full, full spectrum way, you know, if you, it's, it's, um, you know, it's torture on the one end and, you know, and, and I mean, what, what was, you know, every, everything, he gave the most unlibertarian reaction to the New York City bombing as you could possibly imagine today. Um, and then obviously on economic policy, he doesn't care about libertarianism. Either he's happy to sign up for some supply side tax cuts, but he's otherwise basically a statist. So I think that, uh, yeah, again, libertarianism will retain its sort of its sort of appeal among the Republican elite, and that goes a long way. Um, but the sort of opportunity that people saw a few years ago when Rand Paul was, you know, sort of semi-ascendant, and you know there was sort of right-left agreement about sort of government overreach on surveillance and stuff, and um, that, that sort of libertarian moment has ended, and libertarians have to sort of figure out, figure out how to get it back. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned a number of threats uh, that the Defense Department has to deal with. They also consider climate change to be a threat. Where would that fit in the conservatives? Well, um, here, I mean, I, I think generally that the, the correct conservative take on climate change is to acknowledge that it's happening and to support mitigation strategies and be skeptical of global climate agreements and carbon taxes because they're very, very hard to implement successfully and are less likely to tackle, deal with the problem than technological breakthroughs and mitigation strategies. Um, that is, this is not my central area of focus, and so I'm not going to give, be able to give you a detailed, you know, five bullet point argument for why that's true and why I'm not actually, by refusing to support a global carbon tra tax, consigning lower Manhattan to being underwater, right? Um, I, could, I could be wrong about that. In general, I think that in terms of the politics, though, the Republican position on Climate change is much less of a liability than many liberals and moderates think it is. Um, I think that you know there obviously it's an issue that sort of millennials <coughs> supposedly care about and so on. And the millennials in this room can tell me I'm wrong, but in general, I think Republicans are hurt more with millennials by issues around race and social conservatism, especially same-sex marriage, than they are by climate change and. On pocketbook issues, you know, people don't want to pay higher taxes to deal with climate change. Um, and so in that sense, you know, again, setting us out for a sort of Jared Diamond civilizational extinction style fate, the, the Republican position is, the, the Republican resistance to carbon taxes is not, um, not that politically costly. Um, but, I mean, my, yeah, my, my sense is that there's a sort of subset of Republican, of smart Republicans who think that climate change is real, but that its likely impacts are much more uncertain and overstated than sort of most liberals think. Um, and that those Republicans, sh that should actually be the view of Republican politicians. Um, but Republican politicians, for various reasons, find it more convenient to simply tend to deny or obfuscate about 
the existence of the problem. Sir. How, how concerned are you about, and conservatives, about increasing inequality of wealth and income? And what, if anything, should be done about it? I mean, my view tends to be that the, the core issue, the core economic problem in America is an absence of growth, sustained wage growth at the lower end of the income spectrum. But that that problem is not necessarily connected to the growth of incomes at the top of the economic spectrum. And that therefore it's more important to focus on issues of sort of growth, of sort of growth for the middle and lower middle um, than it is for ways to figure out how to shift the income distribution. Um, now, obviously there are a lot of smart arguments that say that those things are connected and the reason that growth isn't happening is that the rich are siphoning things off and so on, but I'm, I'm just, I tend to be fairly skeptical of that. I, you know, I'm a child of the 1990s and in the late 1990s was the last period in which we had sort of remarkable sustained wage growth for the lower middle class. It was a good time. It was also a period when inequality soared because, you know, people were getting rich off pets.com and the tech boom. But it was, there wasn't this kind of intimate link between what was happening with the rich and what was happening for the lower middle class and poor. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm in favor of sort of a little more redistribution of wealth than many conservatives are. Um, but I'm interested in that redistribution as primarily as a means to sort of bettering the prospects of the working class rather than per se getting to, you know, the correct 1957 ratio of capital to labor income and so on. And I think that it's very hard to do that anyway in a hyper-globalized economy and so on. And I think, you know, America has... America has always been a place where great fortunes are made and also a place where the middle class has done well. And I think there isn't any necessary reason why you can't have both. Yes. You. Uh, why did Mike Pence join Trump's campaign if he's a more straightforward and true conservative than Trump? Um, because Mike Pence was in danger of losing his reelection bid in Indiana. And Mike Pence is a politician. And Mike Pence thought maybe he'd win and become vice president of the United States. And Mike Pence thought that even if he lost, he might have be in a good position to run for president in 2020. 20. Um, so basically, the answer is pure ambition. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I. Uh, you know, I, I know for a fact people who said that Pence was commiserating with them about how awful Donald Trump was two weeks before he um, accepted the job of running me. But, you know, it's basically most Republican politicians who are involved in day-to-day -day politics um, have decided to treat Donald Trump as a somewhat regrettable but normal Republican nominee even despite their deep disagreements with him. Um, this has been, and Pence has obviously gone further than that by being on the ticket. Um, but, you know, the, the Republicans who have been most resistant to Trump have been the ones who are out of office, you know, Bush the Bushes, Romney, and so on. And figures like Paul Ryan, who hates everything that Donald Trump stands for, I can promise you that, have, you know, decided that party unity is more important and that, you know, the assumption is Trump will probably lose and you just have to deal with it for six months because if you had resisted him stringently, then you would break the party in different ways and make it harder to win in the future. Now, of course, if Trump ends up winning, then Paul Ryan will have to live with that. So, uh, yes, sir. We... Okay, this will be the last question, sir. There was an interesting article published today, townhall.com, an author named Jack Kerwick, not Kerouac, uh, <laughs> PhD uh, professor. From Kerouac Harvard. voted Republican a couple times. Yeah, well, <laughs> True. I just assume most years here will hear me yeah. enunciating Kerouac instead of Kerwick. But he introduced a new term to me that I think well defines you and the Republican establishment, as it's come to be known during this election cycle, as the alt left. We've heard a lot about the alt right being the poor, disenchanted, racist, uh, white males who are supporting Trump, which I am none of. However, I do certainly support Trump, given the 
grotesque alternative that we face at this moment in time in history. But the alt-left basically looks at people like you, uh, National Review, Crystal, and, you know, uh, that ilk, as neoconservatives who are basically just a couple degrees of separation away from the liberal progressives we purport to fight against. And I have found that exceptionally true. And if you want to look at the real reason why people are clamoring for Trump right now, it's a sense of betrayal within the Republican Party that the Republican establishment, the elite, which notwithstanding other articles you may have written or books you may have written, being a Harvard-educated op-ed writer for the New York Times, the loathsome newspaper that it is, with you serving simply as a foil, as a representative of what the conservative movement is, and I can tell you, as a conservative myself, I don't see you as a conservative. I see you as a, a rather watered-down version of that. You've said a few good things. But, but I can tell you, the reason people are clamoring to Trump is that they have been betrayed. They've been betrayed by a Republican Party that has been elected and given control of the House and the Senate in the last several elections, who has done nothing to truly stand up in the face of progressivism and stop it in its tracks. And right now, those people are of a mind. Say what you will about Donald Trump and his, his antics or the way he presents himself in public, which it's not his fault 25,000 people come out to see him when Hillary can't fill out a conference room somewhere. Uh, and, and to say that that's how he would run his presidency after elected, I think, is, is a bit of a leap. You are part of the Never Trump movement and the Republican establishment that wants to look down your nose at those people who would stand for him, and, and who have been so uh, you know, uh, audacious as to turn their back on the uh, candidates that were put into place that we, we needed to vote for Bush, we needed to vote for Rubio, and, and to have the stupidity to, to not fall for it again, and to pick someone like Trump, really upsets you people. Now, Randy, I don't there believe everything that Trump has I don't trust everything that Trump I don't trust everything that Trump is saying will actually happen. Right. But you know what? The things that the Republican Party has stood for, that they've said that they would stand up for in, in the past, haven't happened either. But we know what Obama does. We know what Hillary will do. We know the risk at the Supreme Court. And for you to sit there and scoff at the notion that Donald Trump can be any worse than we would get by any other Republican put forth, I think is bad. So my, my, my question to you is, are you, why do you scoff at this alternative? Why is the conservative voice on the New York Times editorial page, can you not find in your heart to say anything remotely good about the prospects of a Trump candidate presidency and, and, and look self-reflectively at what the Republican establishment has done to itself and consider, as I said before, the grotesque situation that we stand to face with Hillary Clinton, who is on her deathbed, So let me, let, let me go now. So, okay, first of all, I spent, well, all right, let me make two points. The first point is that it doesn't make that much sense to say that the problem with the Republican Party is that it wouldn't stand up to Obama on issues of conservative principle, and then to nominate and elect someone who is to, closer to President Obama on all the issues that Republicans and the President fought over on economic policy over the last five or six years than any other Republican nominee would have been. Republicans and Obama fought over entitlements. Donald Trump doesn't want to touch entitlements. Donald Trump is a liberal on entitlements. Republicans and Obama fought over Obamacare. Donald Trump says, oh, you know, maybe we'll repeal and replace Obamacare. He's not talked not at all about it in the campaign. The only thing he says about health care is, again, a sort of characteristic left of center line about how, you know, it's important to make sure everyone is taken care of and so on. And I could go down the list of issues where you're fed up with Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and John Boehner for not fighting hard against, enough against, against Obama. Fine, but Trump ran his campaign. And as I just argued, I think it was brilliant because 
I'm actually closer to Trump on a lot of issues than I am to Mitch McConnell, which is what's so weird about this election for me. Um, but Trump, Trump is moving the Republican Party substantially to the left on all of the issues that conservatives were angry at the party for not being far enough right on under Obama. That's just, that's just, that's just policy reality. Not an immigration. That's true. Pro-life? No. Pro-life? Anti-TPP? Donald Trump, I mean, if you believe Donald Trump is pro-life, <laughs> Donald Trump has paid for more abortions. No, no, that's, that's, a, that's, 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 a, that's a total supposition, and I, I shouldn't, this is, this is being taped, so I don't want to impugn the man's character. That's a supposition. Um, I do not think that Donald Trump is authentically pro-life. But I'll, I'll get to your question about Hillary and judges in just a minute. This is, these, these are good questions, so I want to I answer them one by one. So first of all, I think you are underestimating the extent to which Donald Trump is much further left on economic policy than any of the people you were so mad at for not fighting Obama hard enough. Second, to speak personally for a minute, while the Republican establishment was trying to um, was trying to pass comprehensive immigration reform, the one issue that they agreed with President Obama on, I was writing column after column and blog post after blog post and tweet after tweet, because that's what sort of pretentious columnists do, we tweet, opposing that bill, attacking Republicans, attacking the bill, attacking comprehensive immigration reform, and arguing for a perspective not where Trump is, but at the very least where Ted Cruz was in the primary. Donald Trump wasn't really doing anything during that period, except talking about how Obama was actually secretly born in Kenya. So I don't want to be lectured by Donald Trump or his supporters about how I'm insufficiently conservative on immigration because I work for the terrible New York Times. I did more, and I did nothing, obviously. I just write columns, but, I, but even just writing columns, I did more on that issue for conservative principles than Donald Trump ever did. Third, I think the point you raise about Trump and Hillary is a totally reasonable one. It's totally reasonable for conservatives to think to themselves that you know, when push comes to shove, Trump has all these problems, um, Trump, you know, isn't reliable on all of these issues and so on, um, but I have to swallow hard and vote for him anyway. I'm not going to tell you that that's the wrong way to look at it. What I am going to tell you, though, is that I think you underestimate the extent to which there are basic functions of American government, especially in foreign policy, that if they aren't carried out by someone who knows a little bit what they're doing and has people who know a little bit what they're doing around them, could lead to problems much worse than Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, look, I'm pro-life. I've spent my entire career writing pro-life commentary. The last thing I want to see is two more pro-choice justices on the Supreme Court. And it could be that I'm totally wrong and that Trump would be an okay president and would appoint conservative justices and therefore social conservatives should support him. But there is a, what you might call a tail risk with terrible, terrible presidents. And that tail risk isn't just bad liberal policy. It isn't just, you know, things Obama did that we disagree with. It's the collapse of the Western political order and major global conflicts of the likes of which we haven't seen in decades. And I don't think that will happen if Donald Trump is elected any more than I think, you know, we'll have sort of internal dissent and conflict on a scale we haven't seen since the 60s. But it's far more likely than it's been with any presidential candidate, liberal or conservative, in my lifetime. And conservatives who support Donald Trump have to factor that in to their calculus. That Trump is not, is not personally disciplined, that everything he has said and done in this campaign has indicated a total disinterest in the work and the actual work of governing and the way that politics actually works. And that, you know, if you put someone like that in the White House, you are taking a different kind of risk. I'm not saying that you're not taking a risk by accepting Hillary Clinton, um, but you're taking a different kind of risk than you would with any political presidential candidate in my lifetime. So, I appreciate your question, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'd once again like to thank Ross Douthit for his wonderful and incredibly informative words today. It's going to be cold. Yeah. Um,
He is be speaking tomorrow at 8 a.m. at Elm Street in the Seabrook Room. If you want to speak to him there, and he'll also be speaking at the assembly tomorrow. And I speak extemporaneously, so if you come to the assembly, it'll be similar but also different. So thank you all for a very great evening.